Chicago, a city of haves and have-nots. The famous Gold Coast stretches along Lake Michigan, glistening with high-rises and luxury shopping. Yet just five miles away is Pilsen, a predominantly Hispanic working-class neighborhood. Roughly a third of its 40,000 residents fall below the poverty line. To them, Pilsen is simply El Barrio, a place where they feel forgotten. It's a biased system. It's a broken system. Something else is broken here. One gang has made this neighborhood a bloody battleground, a place where power is won and lost every day. They'd love to get rid of us, but they can't. We've, we continue to multiply. They are the Satan Disciples, or SDs. Satan Disciples are known for their street-level drug operations and willingness to kill. Now, they've spilled into the suburbs and more than 20 states. We're here all day, every day. Quit tricking, stop tricking on me. Everywhere, we, we, we worldwide, you know? It's just that we got different brands everywhere, you know? The different sets are structured under one umbrella, the Satan Disciples Nation. There's only one place, though, that these bangers call home. I look at Pilsen as the heart of the Estes, definitely. That's always going to be motherland, always. Thirty-three-year-old Wicked D knows these streets well. A high-ranking SD, he's been busted for stealing cars and armed robbery. If I have to use a gun, then I'm gonna use a gun. I'm gonna take their life before they take mine. Wicked D has been part of the SD family since he was 13. I was pretty much abandoned by my parents. Left me out in the hood, all the same disciple organization. They took me and they raised me. They showed me how to become a man. Trick ass Ambrose. Now he's the one schooling the new crop of gangbangers. I'm not gonna let anybody disrespect me and my shorties. That includes defending them to the death against their rivals. I've never been afraid of dying. If you're afraid of death, then this is the wrong game for you. And battling the cops. They can lock me up 24 7 hours a day, 365 days of the year. I'll be back on that corner the next day. And if you get rid of me, another me sprouts up. That's exactly what worries Chicago authorities. What do you do for gold money? I gang bang. That's all I do. That's all I do. Yeah, look at me, look at me, look at me. What's up? What it's about? The Satan Disciples are masters at hiding their dirty deeds. To keep the heat off, many of them, like Wicked D, have legitimate day jobs. What do you do for yourself? For a living. What do I do? Marketing and sales, man. Marketing and sales? Yo. To the SDs, cash is king, no matter how it's made. It's your choice. It's your freedom of your choice. If you have to sell drugs to make money, hey, then you sell drugs. If you want to work, hell, I make more working than, than I would selling drugs. Everybody makes money. Everybody gets money. The SDs work everywhere, from recording studios to construction. In their minds, they're entrepreneurs. Which means the business next door might be run by gangsters. Don't matter what you do, you know. Some guys might not even sell drugs. Some guys might just be gangster ass but they run legitimate businesses. I've had gang members that, that work in the Foot Locker. I've had gang members that sell real estate. It just depends on the individual. The SDs believe their way of banging is better than most. We're the only organization in this country that has free enterprise. The Chicago PD agrees that some of the SD businesses are legit. But so were many establishments of the city's best known gangsters, Al Capone and the Mafia. Everybody knows how they started and you know how they got the money to legitimize their business. Like the mob, these demons aren't afraid to go after anyone who threatens their livelihood, even law enforcement. They like intimidation. There was a, a sheriff who made a complaint and they tried to set his car on fire.
That's what it's about. It's all day love, money, get dope. F hoes, kill Age 11, That's man. I got up. shot with a all 45 day. ever since. It's a violent game the Satan disciples play. And as this gangster knows all too well, it comes with a price. You think you're mad? There's always someone badder out there. Bobby is one of the SD's highest ranking members. The gang was his birthright. I mean, my brother was an SD. My uncles were SDs. To Bobby, banging seemed natural. His parents saw things differently. My mom didn't like it, period. She didn't raise me like that, but it's just, you know, just the way she is. Her fear was justified. In March 2002, Bobby's older brother Ernie was with another gangbanger smoking water. Guys used to smoke it in squares or in joints, you know? Smoke it, get all f***ed up. It was like a bad whack high or something. A high so bad, it was deadly. One of his friends, you know, got high, smoking some water, you know, had a bad trip, shot him in his head, behind his back, you know. So he died, you know, being with some f***ed up ass drug addict. Then a year later in 2003, Bobby's younger brother, Lorenzo, also an SD, ran into trouble. Lorenzo's crew was hanging with the maniac Latin disciples, allies of the SDs, when an argument broke out. So my brother got into it, you know, started whooping on them, you know. It would be the last thing that Lorenzo ever did. And it just so happened that this dude, he was a coward in his heart. He went and got a pistol, shot my brother. Bobby has lost two brothers to gangbanging. That's just life when you run with the Satan disciples. Nobody can imagine nobody they love being dead. It is what it is, bro. It is what it is. I mean, we joined this when we were young, knowing. I knew what I was in for. Bobby hasn't lost just his family over the years. In 1993, he became friends with Danny Valencia, a.k.a. Gizmo, a promising up-and-comer who was considered a brother by all. Giz was family to everybody. If you were righteous and you were down and you were not a bogus dude or if you were not a bogus crew, Giz was there. That brother was there for anyone. Um, and he showed love to, to you no matter what. At only 21 years old, Gizmo was a natural leader. He was a gangster. He was a gangster. He didn't let, he didn't back down from nobody. He was only about five, four, five, five. He was like Napoleon, pretty much. He was an up and coming rising star. He was a righteous brother. Gizmo had the respect of several gang chapters and was viewed by many SDs as the man who would eventually become their leader, the king of all the Satan Disciple Nation. When Giz was here, we were all together, the whole nation, the whole SD nation. That's what the beautiful thing was about it. You know, we were all together. We were all one. The SDs were united. But that unity and Gizmo's rise to the top was never a sure bet. He didn't deserve, you know, for what happened to him to happen to him, but shit happens. It's the name of the game. On Chicago's south side, in the neighborhood of Pilsen, one gang rules the streets. We're the beast in Pilsen. We're the real around Pilsen. We don't hide our faces. We don't, we don't trick. We don't tell nothing. 60-year-old Ray is an original gangster with the Satan Disciples, or SDs. We had respect, mostly, you know? Like, they feared us. The son of a Mexican immigrant, Ray grew up in Pilsen during the 1950s. I might beat the hell out of me every day. Both rooms are big, thick rooms, not the ones they got nowadays. The fights at home mirrored the violence on the streets. 
racial tensions were high in the predominantly white neighborhood. Puerto Ricans and Mexicans were moving in, and many white residents fled. Those that stayed were less than welcoming. If you're Hispanic or black, you're gonna be spit on a lot. Gangs formed for protection, including the Latin Kings and the Vice Lords. In 1960, 12-year-old Ray wanted in on the action. He and about 12 friends formed their own gang. We had a lot of fights with a lot of people, and, and then we couldn't go past a certain district, so we had to stick together. It's just like, you know, kids at, at a playground, you know, getting into fights and shit. You know, once you, you dislike that individual, you're never gonna like them again. Their first step, choosing a name that would inspire fear in their rivals. It's the same disciple. The same sound was bad, you know? The name came with symbols. They modeled their major one, the devil, on a 1950s comic book character. We were always reading comic books. It was a little devil, you know, like a little, like a little scoundrel, you know? You see the diaper devils here. Uh, diaper devils uh, have been in our history for as long as we, when we first began. Ray's Catholic mother feared her son's affiliation with the devil. She and a friend attempted to perform an exorcism on Pilsen's newest gangbanger. It threw me in a bathtub. They started spitting at me. They, put, they drank whiskey and spitting at me and had cigars and a long cigar smoke all around me. They brought raw eggs on me and they broke the egg. The egg, I swear to God, turned black. Had evil in me, like devil was in me, because that name and everything. From the beginning, the Satan disciples had one prime enemy, the Latin Kings, who were based just a few blocks away. That's where the started. I mean, that's where the Kings, the Kings, they started on 26th Street. Yeah, the Latin Kings and the Satan disciples held territories very close in proximity to each other. So they were competing for the same recruitment pool for getting new members of the gang. But a bigger war was brewing, one that would put an end to raise battles on the streets. In 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident propelled the United States into a military offensive that would eventually become the Vietnam War. To Ray's mother, it served another purpose. In 1967, she enlisted her son with Uncle Sam. She ran over there. She, she ran and took the bus over there and flew over there and said, get him out of here. <laughs> Ray gained membership in a new kind of club, the Marines. Instead of fighting the Latin Kings, now he was battling the Viet Cong. And that's it. Sign me up. I went in 67. Uh, came out like in 71. Ray returned from the jungles of Vietnam to find that the gang had changed. During his absence, the Satan disciples had grown to about 60 strong. They were harder, tougher, selling pot and carrying guns. Ray, now a former Marine, wasn't impressed. He officially broke ties with the gang. I think the punks, they, don't, they ain't got no balls. They, oh, they sell drugs, that's what it is. Throughout the 70s, the Satan Disciples grew stronger. Cops began cracking down on the SDs, busting them for selling narcotics. The SDs soon found themselves in Illinois' prisons, along with the Latin Kings. They realized they were outnumbered. So in 1978, the SDs became part of the Folks Nation, a syndicate with the Gangster Disciples and other Chicago street gangs as members. You're a Satan disciple, you're a part of the folk nation. And that's how it's kept, in order to protect ourselves and show our own protections. It's from within the Folks Nation Alliance that the SDs became more organized. Taking a page from their new allies, they wrote a constitution, one that included a unique code, number seven. And it's spelled out that free enterprise is permissible and, uh, you know, encouraging independent business. Free enterprise, any way to better yourself to make a, a, a living. The other gang constitutions, they don't speak of 
making money, it's not addressed. The Satan Disciples also set up bank accounts. The money was to be reserved for either bonding out a gang member or for a crisis within the gang. As the 1980s dawned, the gang began branching out into Chicago's poor neighborhoods, spreading its brand of capitalism. Uh, those same areas, you know, where they lack economic stimulus. While some members got legitimate jobs, the rest sold drugs. And for the most part, that is what keeps them together, is the drug business. The Satan Disciples created a structure to control the flow of money. Cash flowed from street dealers to the set bosses, eventually all the way up to the king. Once you sell narcotics, yes, you're gonna be making money for yourself, but also you're gonna have to pitch some back in. You're gonna have to pay something back to, to the gang. In the early 80s, one gangbanger rose to the top, Agapito Villalobos, King Aggie. Every Saint Disciple that's an active Saint Disciple knows who King Aggie is, even though they don't know who he is, but they'll know his name. Uh, it's almost as being you're the CEO of a business. Um, he would be the one that would uh, do the orders. In 1983, Aggie was sent to the pen for armed robbery. Even behind bars, his power remained untouched. When Aggie said the word, the disciples did it, including his orders for hits. If you have power, you have control. If you have control, then you're the man. And that's what Aggie had back then. King Aggie, leader of all Satan Disciples, the entire Satan Disciple Nation. It was under Aggie's reign that the Satan Disciples drug operation grew to include cocaine. I think all the gangs were heavy players in the drug trades because the cocaine explosion caused so much product to be out on the streets in Chicago. These traffickers needed somebody to move it, so naturally they turned to the gangs. During the 1990s, the SD's empire grew along with their bank accounts. New sets began popping up across the city and into the suburbs. I can't really give a number, but I know we're thousands deep, thousands. We were the major, we were the major Everybody respected us. At 14 years old, Bobby helped start up a new chapter in the nearby suburb of Cicero. Man, we got down on my You know what I'm saying? We got down. I had my back up from the city. My uncle, you know, all my people over there, help me out, whatever you need. In Pilsen, kids like Wicked D were used to the threat of violence. When I was a little bit younger, I used to be afraid. Walk around, see, see a bunch of on the corner, hanging up, you know, hanging around, walking around with guns. I got used to seeing it all the time. It just became a normal day of life, everyday life. Overseeing the SD's growth was a charismatic young gangbanger named Danny Gizmo Valencia. He ran things on the outside while King Aggie was behind bars. Valencia was second in command and obviously, you know, taking care of things when uh, the leader was in jail. You know, he didn't let nobody f with him or his nation. Nobody. You know, if somebody had a problem, it don't matter what side of town. South side, all the way to Aurora. You had a problem, Giz was gonna be there. And Giz was gonna make sure that we were on the winning side. Gizmo had a lot of knowledge. Uh, he was there when you needed him. Uh, just because of the power he held, uh, didn't matter to him. His power did matter to one person, King Aggie. To him, Gizmo was an upstart who hadn't put in the necessary work. You just come out of nowhere, you know? You know, these guys have been SDs for 20, 20 years, and they've, they've put in a lot of SD work, a lot of nation business. After 12 years behind bars, Aggie was released from prison in April 1995. Now 40 years old, he expected to assume his place atop the SDs, but things had changed in his absence. By the time it, that Agapito got out, I think there is some kind of a little generation gap. A divide began growing, pitting the young guns against the old guard. It all came to a head at a gang meeting in November.
King Aggie wanted to use gang money to purchase guns, with him overseeing the process. One of the members questioned him, challenged him on the collection of dues because the question was, hey, what exactly is our money going to? Word on the street was the king was using gang funds for his personal pleasure. So the question was, was he using the money for himself or was he using the money for the gang's guns and, and whatever else they need? King Aggie took offense, but his challengers went one step further. One particular member actually said, we like Danny Valencia, and if you don't tell us what you're doing with this, we're going to vote him in as the leader of the gang and, and vote you down. At that point, prosecutors believe King Aggie made a pact with the devil. A handful of people knew it was coming. For more than 40 years, the notorious Satan Disciples, or SDs, have terrorized Chicago's south side neighborhood of Pilsen. On building after building, they claim their turf with tags. Cook County investigator Frank Odoma knows their markings well. Some of the things that you look for, if you notice up on the top there, it's got the two little Looks like the two horns. She has two horns on the left and one on the right. That's, a de that's gonna be a devil's head. On a nightly basis, Doma does a dangerous dance with the SDs, patrolling the dark streets for trouble. What's up, guy? Uh, You're just the one I wanna see, man. Come here. Yes, yes, sir. What is uh, your primary income? What do you guys do to get money for the street games? Ah, uh, we, we, we work. You know, what, kind of, what, what, kind, what kind of jobs do you do? Working, you know, factories. Factory, like just to come a day work like everybody else does. Yes, sir. And know? then what do you guys do? In your spare time, you what, do what? We just come out here and hang out hang like out. everybody else, you know? Serve and protect like y'all do. Serve and protect from? From the other oppositions. <laughs> what's your name, Shorty? What's your short? What's your name? What's this? Little Scooby. Hey. Come here, Shorty. Turn around this way. Little Scooby. You want to see that bullet that went? I got right here a uh, bullet hole from a rival gang member. At this point, he doesn't know who did it. Yeah. He look, you need stitches. Why don't you go to the hospital? Show I already you went. When in Bogus Cook County, that's what it is. Hey. Went in right there. The Satan Disciples' colors are yellow and black and can be seen everywhere you look. I can spot a member if he's in a member of an organization. I can spot him a mile away. The more hardcore ones came out with their shirts with the shirts representing the gang. Hey, I hate everybody. All that opposes me. If you ain't an SD, get it. A lot of street gang members, when you confront them with their gang affiliation, they deny it. However, with the Satan Disciples, are always more than willing to admit to their gang affiliation. The SDs use a repertoire of sinister hand signals when they represent. Lock it in. Oh, bam, bam, bam. bam. We throw up the pitchfork, and then we come back around and make the SD. Oh, you shake up, show respect, throw up the fork right there. You lock it back in for the S and the D right there. You throw up the forks right there just to show love right there. Their ink is full of devilish imagery and is the gang's biggest source of pride. You name it, pitchforks, the shield of the SDs. Nieves, a tattoo artist, is one of the Satan Disciples' legitimate businessmen. Although he asked us not to show his face, he did allow cameras a rare look inside the inner sanctum, his tattoo parlor. In this Pilsen area, the Chicagoland area, you see a whole lot of crazy every day. Nieves got into tattooing while he was locked up. At age 14, he was gangbanging on Chicago streets. Before long, he got picked up by the cops. I was locked up for a bunch of crazy stuff when I was young. He did his bid in the Illinois Youth Center in St. Charles, struggling to fill the hours until a cellmate showed him how to make a gun. Somebody showed me how to make a gun real simple, and the next thing you know, I was tattooing every cellmate I had and myself. And ever since then, I've just been doing it and doing it. For Nieves, death is just a reality of being a disciple. 
Yep, family, yep. People that I've grown up with and seen, known them since they were real young babies and seen them in caskets. Tattooing allows Nieves to honor his fallen brothers and strengthen the SD's street cred at the same time. I like when people come and tell me, oh yeah, I seen your work over here, or I seen this guy. They both got my work in there, so now they got something in common, you know? Through the years, the Satan Disciples mascot has changed with the times. It was more baby devil, and like now with the generation all in the hip hop and all that, it's more like hip hop devil. You could put them doing all kind of evil ass With the six points, with his thing, the actual guy. SD tattoos aren't easy to earn. You've got to be affiliated. Some join out of choice, others from necessity. I know a kid that was recently shot, probably a month ago, in the head, just because he lived in the hood. And coming out of the hospital, he turned, became a member of the SDs. And now they're gonna feel his wrath. They started it. We've got to finish it. Getting initiated into the SDs isn't for the weak. They don't just take anybody, you know what I'm saying? We take brothers with heart, you know? Having heart requires surviving an initiation rite where the newcomer is violated. You get how you get violated, huh? You get your ass whooped, you know? You get your ass whooped by four or five, depending on how big the dude is, you know? Gotta make sure the is tough. The bigger the initiate, the more gang members involved, and the longer the beating. A couple minutes. A couple minutes, dude, it's like forever, you know? Once in, a new recruit has to follow the Satan Disciples' constitution. In addition to encouraging free enterprise, this document lays out the rules. No rape, no hard drug usage, and most importantly, no snitching. You know, tricking or becoming, you know, an informant is a very bad thing because it, it shows lack of trust, lack of confidence. And to us, that's a very important factor. All meetings must open and close with an oath and prayer. But who are these devil-wearing gangsters praying to? Mm. Some I probably wouldn't want to talk about. Nah, uh, no. If the SDs worship anything, it's cold, hard cash. And they have the gang's blessing to do whatever it takes. Everybody does different. Some guys are just all out there doing whatever, taking care of whoever they got to take care of. To the SDs, the real devil is the strong arm of the law. They want to keep us down. It's, it's the system. It's all up. Chicago Southside, 1995. For more than a decade, Satan Disciple leader Agapito Villalobos, a.k.a. King Aggie, had overseen the gang's most lucrative years from behind bars. Now he was back on the streets and wanted to reclaim the throne, but the SDs weren't having it. The respect wasn't there. The respect wasn't there. On November 1st, at a Satan Disciples meeting, a member suggested that King Aggie step down and allow his right-hand man, a popular 23-year-old named Danny Gizmo Valencia, to take his place. So that meeting uh, was, was held, and that meeting was very, uh, for, for Villalobos, obviously, disturbing. The meeting broke up around 11 p.m. Just a few hours later, at 4 in the morning, Gizmo was summoned by the king. And he was paged uh, to go back to Aggie's house. Gizmo drove to Aggie's home. He got out of the car, unaware of what was about to happen. When he arrived through the gangway, through the back from the alley, uh, they actually shot him um, in the back. The man many SDs thought could lead them into the next millennium was executed. Gizmo got shot over 10 times in his face. Well, you know, in his head. They either 
had the gun right up to his head or you know within a, a foot uh, from his head because there was actually stippling um, around the wound which indicates close range firing i just know he got shot a lot of times and he died a horrible death and he didn't deserve it witnesses told police that the shots came from the neighboring alley they also provided a motive what we learned, again, from witness who overheard a conversation, Valencia was going to be hit that particular day because Villalobos wanted him hit. Chicago authorities charged three high-ranking Satan disciples with first-degree murder. King Aggie, the godfather of the disciples, was one of them. He skipped town, though, before police could arrest him. Six months later, the King was picked up in Dallas, Texas, and extradited back to Illinois. In the ensuing trial, one shooter named Vicious Trejo was convicted and sentenced to 30 years in prison. The other defendants, including King Aggie, walked after a key eyewitness changed her testimony. She, as we would say, she flipped us, so I believe the judge felt that her testimony wasn't enough uh, to convict Villalobos beyond a reasonable doubt. The court may have found Aggie not guilty, but the Satan disciples had their own opinion. Whatever respect he had left, I guess that deteriorated. Whatever respect he had left, you know, I know I don't respect him. The gang officially took King Aggie off the throne. So before he took the rest of the nation down, we decided to remove him. He had nothing else. He had no say-so in the mob. King Aggie went into seclusion, laying low in the Chicago area still to this day. But even with Aggie out of the picture, the damage to the gang was already done. This was the man, the Renaissance man, you know, pretty much. So, you know, when he got killed, you know, that was the worst thing that could have happened to us. Slowly, the infighting started. A lot of guys played both sides for a long time. At the turn of the century, a handful of SDs jockeyed for the top spot. With each new power struggle, the gang fractured a little more. The guys who wanted to run shit after they felt they had gears out of the way, they weren't doing shit with an eye, you know. They were celebrating, but they should have been crying because everything was about to go down the drain. Everything. It's like anything else. You know, some guys try to step up to the front and, and take the leadership roles, but um, they can't. It's not the old pyramid, you know. It's, it's now you've got many little pyramids, and those are the situations that, uh, fortunately enough, police capitalize on. The Chicago PD began dismantling the Satan Disciples. With no primary leader, the gang fell into chaos. Disarray, it, it puts them in a disarray because it's more so every man for himself type deal. Um, there's no unity. When there's not a leader, there's not the loyalty, you know, and they're more willing to cooperate with the police now. It was structure. There was no more structure. Everybody did what they want. Everybody went their own way. The more the SDs fell apart, the more vicious they became to one another. August 1999, in an apartment on the northwest side of Chicago, Satan disciple Teodoro Baez, AKA Mandingo, got into an argument with fellow SD Juan Estrada over a drug deal. As Mandingo admitted in this interrogation video, things got out of control. Uh, at first, I tried to negotiate with him, and then when I felt negotiation was not possible, I reacted in uh, a truly hostile manner. Mandingo pulled out a gun. Juan underestimated him. Shot Juan when he wasn't looking, you know. Mandingo continued the assault, stabbing Estrada 59 times with a samurai sword. His demonic rage didn't stop with Juan. Juan was, you know, had somebody with him, you know, 
that wrong place, wrong time for that person. That person was Juan's girlfriend, who had been waiting for him in his car. Mandingo lured her into the apartment and then stabbed her to death. He then took the samurai sword and dismembered both of their bodies. What did you do with the swords? Uh, I cleaned them up and left them around the house to, to try to think of some elaborate scheme to get rid of them. Mandingo spread Juan and his girlfriend's body parts all over town. Most of the woman's body was found by some West Side Railroad tracks, while Estrada's torso turned up in a vacant lot. What did you clean up with? Um, clean the solution like 401, uh, fantastic, things like that. A few days later, the rest of Estrada's body was found floating in the Chicago River. Nobody deserves that. But he lost his life, she lost her life, and there will never be another dude like Juan. Mandingo was put on death row, and the Satan disciples continued to spiral downward. The only question was how low would they go? Chicago is a gangster city, gangster town. It's dangerous, it's gonna always be dangerous. At the turn of the millennium, the Satan disciples were struggling. Nearly five years after Gizmo's murder, several potential chiefs tried to step up, only to fail. The individuals that tried to step up and take weren't liked by many other sections or branches of SDs. Just didn't work out. Either they're getting mixed up, wrapped up in drugs, selling drugs, who knows, but everybody had their downfall. The one gangbanger who had the best chance to lead was Tommy Parra, AKA Tommy Gunn. Tommy Parra was very influential. He was a sharper individual. He took over the SDs, but his reign was short-lived. In March of 2000, in a housing area called Rockwell Gardens, Federal agents launched an undercover operation codenamed Operation Rock. Slowly, they got inside of the SD's drug trade. We would pose as, as just regular middle class, you know, hardworking like factory workers, truck drivers. We get dirtied up, you know, and you know, dirty our hands, you know, dirty our clothing. The undercover agents would enter the Rockwell Gardens building to make drug buys, usually purchasing pot or crack cocaine. The business was conducted in or around that stairwell. Once you get down to the stairwell, usually there was more people down there. They'd pat you down, they'd put hands on you, make sure you didn't have a weapon on you. You buy your narcotics, you're off to, uh, to do another one. For more than two years, authorities built their case. Agents say Tommy Gunn was going outside the SD family to conduct gang business, supplying the gangster disciples with narcotics. All bets are off when it comes to money. A lot of times it's not about uh, the gang turf, it's about making money. And it's about distributing either heroin, crack cocaine, marijuana. And that would, that's what this group did. If you ask me, he didn't have any business with them, period. Shouldn't have had business with them. Using surveillance video and wiretaps, investigators tracked Tommy's every move. In September of 2002, they arrested him and charged him with drug trafficking. Then they found out something surprising. Tommy Parra, his father, was a captain with the Chicago Police Department. While authorities say Tommy's father was clean, his son was deeply entrenched in the drug trade. He had connections with uh, you know, the Mexicans and the Hispanic uh, narcotic tra traffickers, therefore was able to get various quantities of uh, cocaine, soft cocaine, as in powder cocaine, as well as uh, large quantities of marijuana. Tommy was convicted of numerous charges, including intent to distribute cocaine, and was sentenced to 25 years. The Satan disciples were in shock. He was a good guy, that's all I know. You know, he took care of his daughter. You know, he wasn't running around, you know, bogus. That's all I gotta say about Tommy.
When he got taken down, uh, the, the, the mob, every, everybody's uh, knees began to buckle because they didn't know uh, what was going to happen. Today, there is no confirmed leader of the Satan Disciples. Chicago PD suspects someone is pulling the strings, but say he's hiding behind the shell of a business, waiting for the right time to seize control. Police will not discuss the suspect on camera. It's a power thing, you know I mean? I'm the man in control. And who is actually in control? The Satan Disciples claim this supposed leader doesn't exist. The power you give to one individual is too plentiful for one individual. Wicked D says the gang is evolving with the 21st century, substituting the CEO rule with rule by committee. We actually have, you know, uh, a board of directors now that replaced that void, and it's been running a lot better than just by one individual. Regardless of who's actually running the gang, the Chicago police agree that the Satan Disciples are still dangerous. Satan Disciples are still a viable threat, a very violent street gang, still actively engaged in narcotics trafficking and weapon sales. We're still a threat. We are still a threat. SDs will always be a threat to everybody. They've even brought their message to the internet, spreading their gospel far beyond the Pilsen neighborhood where they started. 1A, what a Sabat right here, 18th and Oakley, all you f ass, bitch ass n look at my face, I ain't hiding my face, 18th and Oakley, side, oh. You go to different websites and you'll see, you'll, you, you'll see they're flatly, uh, flatly putting their colors out there uh, on the internet, they're putting their nicknames on there. And while the SDs claim to be in control behind closed doors, on the streets of Chicago, it's a different story. Oh, I didn't get along at all. You know, they're very violent towards each other. This gang life is hard. It's crazy out here, you know what I'm saying, G? Nuts. Nuts. see a lot of crazy <laughs> out there. You see my face, I ain't hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I'll die for mine. I believe in this. It's almost like the blind leading the blind, you know? Bobby is still a Satan disciple, but claims to stay away from the gang banging of his youth. I don't know, man. Some kids ruining their lives for something that they don't even know the meaning of. Today, he works construction for a former gangbanger and tries to put food on the table for his wife and kids. Give me a paycheck, you know, so I can take care of my family. I'll work for it. In his heart, he still supports the SD's core tenant, Free Enterprise. Man, it really ain't nobody's business how you make your money. You know, it ain't really nobody's business. And you do what you gotta do. People don't understand, man, where we come from. They just see a gangbanger, they see him as a piece of garbage. So, f them, they don't give a f I don't give a f either. Wicked D says he could never turn his back on the SDs. He's in for the long haul, even if it means losing his soul. I'll never leave. I'll never stop being the same disciple. I'm always gonna be an SD, whether I'm 60 or 100 years old. I'm gonna be an SD. They are my brothers and I am my brother's keepers.